filling in our chart, right? I hope you already you have that. You know, uh, you'll have to copy off somebody else's so that you can fill in as you go. We're on the last line. This is the fourth step in our six. You're good. We're getting yours. Okay. All right. Go get. Oh, are there? Okay. Go we'll grab them for us. Right. So week four there in our chart. Okay. Uh, is if you wanted to write down a little title over in the box that says week four, the simplicity of the gospel would be a good title for that. Okay, the simplicity of the gospel. All right now, under who? It's not as much who as it is response. It's kind of you. It's me. Okay, it's the response to the gospel. All right, Samuel, I guess was telling you by Jake so. So, the, so our who really is me, but it's not about me, it's about my response, okay? Nature, what's our nature? What's the nature of that person on each you know, box as we went to fill it in each time? It's, it's that when I respond correctly to the gospel, I become a disciple, okay? So in that box, it's disciple. I, the, I take on the nature of a disciple, I'm, if you want to write underneath the word disciple, this word, I'm in the process of sanctification in my life. Okay? I'm in that process of sanctification in my life. Well, what action happens? Well, if I have responded rightly to the gospel and I have become a disciple who's being sanctified, then the action that's going to happen out of me, is I'm going to take a guess what that would be? What's going to come out of me now? Yes, in the form of... Worship. Worship. Yeah, somebody was getting over there. That's right. Worship. Okay? So the action there is that I'm becoming a worshiper. A worshiper. Now, in each one of these things, we had a result. Okay? In, the, in God's line in week one, what the result was, he's the creator. He's created. Creation is the result. Week two in man, all of our other stuff, we bring the fall. Right? That's the result. Uh, Jesus brings reconciliation. When we respond correctly... Eventually, what we have is consummation, or what the Bible sometimes calls glorification. That someday I'm going to be with Jesus, all my sins removed, all of the struggle with sin is over, all the victory won, and I'll be with Him in glory. The consummation of a worshiper of God, okay? glorification. Right. So that's kind of filling in all of our box. The truth of the gospel is that God created, we destroyed. Jesus restores, right? It's kind of what we just went over in our three circles, right? This restoration comes to us at what cost? To us. What cost to us? Nothing. What do we do to earn it? It is by grace alone through faith alone. It matters not what I've done in my past. All my sin can be covered by the grace of God. You can think about this. What sin can you commit? It can't be covered by the blood of Christ. Isn't that, isn't that a beautiful thought? Isn't that a beautiful thought? And boy, I tell you what, that's <coughs> the message. That's the message that a lost and dying world needs to hear. Okay, so this has tremendous implications for us in the church. Okay, implications. Implications of a gospel that costs us nothing. <laughs> okay, of, of a gospel that costs us nothing. A gospel that comes by faith alone. A gospel that comes not based on our merit. Right? Here it is. The vilest of sinners in our community, the vilest sinner you can think of in Metropolis could one day be the pastor of this church. You ever thought of it like that? I was praying about how do I illustrate this the other day, and I was just like, that's it right there. Because the vilest sinner that I know that grew up in Denton, North Carolina, did become a pastor in this church. You know, And I'll give you another illustration. And I've got to be careful when I'm doing this, but I'm in this room full of really good friends that get it, and so this is not by way of gossip, but it's almost by way of both celebration and prayer request. Uh, you know who the last dad was that I talked to just a minute ago that's excited about getting his kids in bridge ministry so that they can learn about the gospel? Because he says it's good for me because I need to learn about it because I'm just getting into it. And that's Tony Ginger. You some of you guys know him? No? Guy spent some time in prison. He's an alcoholic. All this, that, and the other. He, got, he claims he got saved a couple weeks ago out on his boat. Some Christian guy that he works with shared the gospel with him, and dude got saved. Man. Isn't that awesome? Now, this makes me want to shout. I don't have no more voice left, so I probably shouldn't because my voice is, is really kind of leaving me here tonight. But 
the vilest of sinners. And I'm not saying Tony's any more vile than me or you or anybody else. And that's not the point that I'm making. But the vilest of sinners might one day be your pastor. Or, or a deacon. Or the guy sitting in the pew next to you. That means that we have to have in our church, okay, an attitude and an atmosphere of grace. Of knowing that every time that vile, filthy sinner walks through the door, that they could soon get blown up by by God's grace and become family. You realize that? You you think about all that Old Testament language that God uses, right? As He says, I'm creating what for myself? A people. Right? Right? And and that transfers over into the koinonia language of the New Testament. We come together in God's grace as the family of God in a church. So so when 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 the pothead gets saved, when the drunk gets saved, when the murderer gets saved, okay, when the workaholic gets saved, when the guy who looks really good on the outside but is still sinful on the inside gets saved, they become our family. Because he's creating for himself, right here at First Baptist Church of the Travels, people. People for himself and for his name. So we must, implications of this amazing gospel that costs us nothing, is that we have to be givers of that grace. We've got to create an atmosphere in our church of grace. Everything we do is to be meritated in the grace of God. So that everybody that walks through the door doesn't feel the weight of sinfulness upon them in the negative sort of gossipy way that it can happen in the church. So I want them to feel conviction that comes to the Holy Spirit, absolutely. I want them to feel welcome at the table of God's grace. Okay? Alright, now we're gonna we're gonna read some scripture together, all right? I need you to turn with me to <coughs> chapter two. One of my favorite gospel passages. Ephesians chapter two.
it almost looks like that guy could, you know, if I poke him, is he going to respond, you know, even though he's dead? But then you find somebody that's been out in the river for a few days out in the hot sun, her body's going to be all in a grotesque state, right? You put that in a casket and roll it out there. Now, those two bodies look very different. One looks like it might have life, but it doesn't. The other one doesn't look like it has life, and it doesn't. You know what they both have in common? They're both equally dead. You know, so we might look nice on the outside, you know, or you might look rotten on the outside. But the bottom line is, Paul's making sure you know you're dead. Okay, all right, number two, what else do we find in there? Children of wrath. Okay, that's the fifth one. That was the last one. You want to go out of order for me, thank you. All right, we are children of wrath. What does that mean? What does that mean? That's got to be one of the scariest phrases in the entire Bible. And he's writing to them as saved people, reminding them what they were before they were saved. So every person, remember, he goes on to say, like, like the rest of the world. In other words, those that are outside of God's grace. They are children of wrath. Who's wrath? Mm -hmm. And they're going to take the full weight in. All right, what are the other three? Come up with the fourth one. I'll just, you know, I mean, an extra one. I'll just <coughs> blow me away. But that's all right. Followers of the world. We're, we're world followers. That's right. Now, you don't mean that in a good way, does it? When the rest of the world, at the end of verse 3, when he speaks of like the rest of the world, he's talking about all those outside of grace who are chasing after all kinds of sinful things, not God, right? So we're followers of the world. What else? Yeah. Can we just put it this way? They're devil worshippers. Yep. Right? Devil worshippers. Now that, in this room you guys get that, you know? Unfortunately, for people outside of the faith, they're going, I have never worshipped the devil. Right? If you had come to me when I was 16 and said you're a devil worshiper, us, you're <coughs> crazy, right? Yet, the biblical truth is every person outside of God's grace belongs right here on number three. All right, what's number four? It's kind of hard to say, right? Kind of, I, what's, what's the way to say this? We are. How do you want to say it? What? Sons of disobedience. That's a good way of putting it. Okay, um, uh, I, I like this phrase that I got out of the book that we're using is the, the you know, Matt Chandler put it this way, he said, appetite driven. You like that? I like the way that he puts that. Appetite driven. I can't spell appetite. I don't think. Can I spell it? Nope. I can't. Did I get it right that time? Yeah. Probably not. Alright, I did. All right. So we are appetite driven. <clears throat> now what does he mean by that? Flesh is the boss. <coughs> Who said that? That's pretty awesome. Dude, you're going to be the teacher's pet tonight. That's pretty cool right there. <coughs> My flesh is the boss. If it feels good, I'm doing it. Okay? If I think it might make me feel good, I'm trying it. But whatever cravings come through, I'm just going to I'm going to entertain them all. Right? I'm going after it. With no thought of consequences in all life. Right? Okay, so... <clears throat> This is what Paul says we are before we meet Jesus. So the guy that stands around saying, um, I'm not so bad, it just got blown up by the dynamite of God's truth. <laughs> right? Because those two bodies, while they're in different states of decay, they're both dead. And then not too long, they're both going to look equally the same. <laughs> right? Like dry skeletons. Because they're both equally dead. So we blow that notion up right out, we throw it right out the window. Okay, we're going to have a hard time recognizing how lost we are unless we come and look at God's Word and how He holds it up for us. You know, that's what Paul's trying to do. He's trying to make sure that you realize how lost either you are if you're outside of God's grace or, or how lost you were before you came to God's grace. 
You know, and it's one of those things where I think a guy can realize, hey, I'm lost, and cry out to God. And then the more that you learn about God and His holiness in week one, the more you realize how lost you were, and then you get really scared. You get really scared. You know? And you don't realize the danger you were really in. You know, somebody says, hey, that is a little rickety, and you walk across it anyway. And then afterwards, you get underneath there, and you realize how rickety it is, and you get scared about what you just did. I shouldn't have walked across the bridge, or... The ice was thinner than I thought, or whatever analogy you want to use. But sometimes you look back and you realize, I didn't realize how dangerous what I did was, right? You come here as a saved man and look at that through spiritual eyes, and you realize, dude, I was lost. I have no hope in this world. I'm in trouble. Cliff, right? I, think, I think it's it's important that we understand this if we're gonna if we're gonna lead folks to Christ, because most people that are susceptible to the gospel don't usually think that that's their problem. It's their money's gone or their family's broke up or yep. whatever their issue is. They think that's their problem. And we have to understand that this is really their problem. And sometimes you've got to be quite the <coughs> diplomat to get the conversation to this uh, and at the same time address what, you know, what their needs are. Absolutely. Because we're not saving them from their marriage or we're not nope. saving them from... Tax man. The tax man. We're saving them from their sins. Yes. And they don't usually know that their sins are the problem. One of the most, look, I, I believe this a hundred percent. You can't get saved until you know that you're lost. And I think our job often, depending upon who that individual, sometimes you get those individuals that come in and they already know it. And that's why they're there and God's already been working on them. But often when you're sitting on the plane, with the guy, and you're telling him, and he says, why are you doing what you do, you know, or or you're, you're talking to that family member, or whatever, you're trying to share the gospel, you get you to recognize this, rule number one, priority number one is, you've got to get them lost, you've got to convince them of the state that they're in, you know, <coughs> Dr. Oliver can't help a guy with cancer if he denies that he has it, right, the bottom line is, that tumor's going to keep doing what it does, and it's going to kill him. We got a cancer called sin. We have to make sure that people understand it before they can get saved. It's important to understand, too, it's been very popular in probably the last 50 years to take a shortcut on this. And guys will start out with the felt needs, those very things that John just talked about. My marriage is falling apart. I'm broke. I got this problem. I got that problem. If I get saved, will Jesus take care of all that? And what's happened is a lot of evangelists and a lot of gospel presentations have just said, yes, just ask Jesus in your heart and you'll be fine. The problem is, is they're coming from, from the wrong standpoint. They're coming to try to get, they're, they're, they're not trying to come to fix their real deep spiritual problem. What we've got to show them is the reason you have those other problems is because you have a sin problem. And if they don't understand that they have a sin problem, I'm going to say this, they can't, it's, they won't, when close to McCall about this minute, they can't be saved. Bottom line is, if they think that they're coming to get something off of God, just a new family or a new this or a new that, just the blessing, don't understand that what they're coming to is fix the heart problem, they're going to miss the repent part of this thing in a minute. And that's the central part of the equation. Jesus didn't come just to give us a better life. He came to rescue us from our sin. If we don't get them to that point, we kind of miss the gospel. And that's why there's such a big concern about this issue in the church today. You know what I'm saying? And I can talk to a hundred different, I'm using a lot of different stories for you if you wanted to. So they're all night tell you about story after story of guys that came for the wrong reason. And they end, they end up in the wrong play. You know what I'm saying? They end up with a misunderstanding of salvation. So you have to start here. It's okay that a guy comes for the wrong reason. That's right. Right? Because none of us came for the right reason. But we have to give them the truth when they come and get their mind in the right place. I, you know, I, the best illustration I can give is this. You know, most of you were here last week, and I told the story about, the, about Pierre East. I hope he's in your prayer list. Pierre East is that voodoo priest that Darren and I got to share the gospel with. Um, and he asked that question that I said last week. It's been haunting me, you know, that, okay, if I come to faith in Christ, my family, how can I send them to school and how can I feed them? Every, you know, Darren and I talked about this on the way back. Everything within me wanted to say, you know, Jesus will feed you. I wanted to say that desperately. You know what? They might not. 
Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are starving <coughs> every day. Because trials and perseverance are part of the Christian experience. And I cannot promise that guy that he'll have plenty of food for his family or that he'll be able to educate his kids. All I can promise him is that he's lost. And that there is but one hope for his lostness. If he wants to not spend an eternity apart from Christ, he has to throw himself at the mercy of Christ. That's it. Because he's lost. And his greatest problem isn't his poverty, it isn't his stomach, it isn't his lack of food. It's his lack of grace on his life. Because I would rather starve to death on this earth than have to face eternity lost without Jesus. Wouldn't you? You know, I said this last week, we better know what we believe. And that's the truth of the gospel. And that's the truth of the gospel. Okay, read with me. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll start verse 4. Right we'll stop verse 4. <clears throat> As Clay so eloquently put it to a bunch of young children one day, the biggest and most beautiful but in all of the Bible, but God. All of this, truth, but God. All of this, hopeless, helpless. That's where we're at. We can't do a thing to save ourselves. When you're dead, what can you do to revive yourself? <coughs> what can a dead body do to revive itself? We have as much hope as a dead body. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved. Notice how he says that over and over again. Through faith. And this is not your own gift. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him, that we should walk but the good news is this. God. God. We were in this condition. But what does God do instead? We're dead. What does God do? He gives us a lot. He raises. Right? He raises. Pick this up. Right? We, we are absolutely world followers. And yet God still comes in and he rescues us. Right? <coughs> He rescues us. We're most devil worshippers. And yet even in the midst of that, whoops, he ransoms us. He pays the ransom. Okay? We're sons of the devil. And he comes in and says, Nope. I'm buying that kid back. He's mine. And I'm paying the price. I'm going to ransom him. He said he was our ransom for many. We, we're <clears throat> appetite driven, and yet he comes in and he reforms us. He reforms us. We're chasing after every whim, every sin, every whatever that's coming our way, and yet God begins to work through the power of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to say, nope, I want to start giving you an appetite for the glories of God and for the riches of the kingdom so that your, your desire for sin begins to go away and your desire for me gets greater. I heard John Piper put it this way one time. He says, our only hope to get in dealing with the temptations of sin is for us to develop a superior taste for the things of God. So he reforms our want-tos. I would almost say he gives, he gives you new appetites. Yes, he does. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Now, we still battle sin. Every one of you are still battling sin in your own way. We've all got our own little pet sins. We all still have to struggle in our own way. So we still, but he does. He begins to give us these new appetites so that we're developing new tastes for a new appetite while we're still trying to do away with the, you know, put to death that which is of the old. That's exactly right. Okay? We go from becoming, we were children of wrath, and he reconciles. He reconciles. <laughs> he reconciles us. He reconciles us 
You realize that? He didn't call somebody else and ask them to do it. He doesn't ask us to do it. Nobody else does it. He is the reconciler. That's heavy. That's got depth to it. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around that. You know, I'm the destroyer. He's the reconciler. Okay, so who does all this? Who's doing all that? It's God. God himself. Okay, how then are we saved? By grace. By grace. By grace. Whose grace? God's. God's grace. Right? Through what? Through our faith. It is by faith that we are saved. It's, Paul even points out, even that is a gift from God. Right? So, let me remind you, how much of this is you? Isn't that amazing? Now, that brings up a whole basket full of questions that I don't have answers to. Okay? All I know is this. I'm just going to trust in my father. No, he got it figured out. I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg, all right? I'm just glad to eat chicken and have scrambled eggs for breakfast, okay? But I just know that he gets all the glory. And we're supposed to get all the joy. That's the way it works. Who gets to boast about that? Well, he does, but not us. No, no man gets to boast, but God gets to boast. Okay? Now, Joe kind of already mentioned this. The gospel, the gospel, okay, is such a powerful thing that it necessitates in us in a reaction. Okay? A reaction. What Jesus has done for us demands a response. Now, that response may come in the form of hatred. It does. Or it may come in the form of passion. But it's going to come. The gospel is powerful and it will demand a response. Everyone will respond somehow. We either, our hearts are softened towards Jesus and we are drawn towards Jesus or people are, hearts are hardened and they're driven away from Him. But it always elicits a response. When we share the gospel, the hearer, his heart, must move. It's either going to, towards Jesus or it's going away. Okay? It'll, um, it'll either awaken a heart or it'll harden a heart. Right? Now, what we want to talk about is the person who's moving towards Jesus. Now, we all know this. Even though a heart might get hardened because it rejects the gospel over and over and over and over again, if they're still breathing, they're still whole. Because I don't care how hard their heart got, there's this dynamite, this TNT called grace that God can just blow them up with and give them a new heart at any point. And that happens. Okay? But for us, the big question is, what do we do with that person who says, okay? What do we do with that person that says, I think I'm interested? Or that's somewhere in that scale or whatever you want to call them, they're, they're becoming convinced, their hearts are softening, they're coming towards the Lord. What is the part here in our little box that is response? Okay, uh, Somebody's going to turn to Acts with me. Chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. Who's got that one for me? <coughs> All right, Carl, you can get that one. Thank you for volunteering. All right. My phone's dead. Romans. Oh, your phone's dead. <laughs> I don't have a Bible. Oh, well. Okay. All right, Robin, you got that one. Acts 2. All right. It'll be verses 37 and 38. I need uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10. I bet half of you can quote it. You got that one? Hang on, Cass, because Acts 2 doesn't go with that one. What? <laughs> Does it not? I'm in the wrong uh, I wrote down a typo. I'll have to go find that one. All right, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Somebody be looking that one up for me. I'll figure out what verse I needed here. Yeah, it's... Uh, Give me the scriptures. Quote me the scriptures. I got it. Uh, Yeah, it is. Yeah, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Acts 2. It's Acts 2. Yeah. What Bible are you reading back here, Bob? <laughs> He's got Sprint. He's got Sprint. <laughs> <laughs> Acts 2. Yeah, okay. Acts 2. Oh, there it came. There it came. Yeah, wait till it loads in there. I'm sorry. So that's all right. That's, that's hilarious. All right. What is it? Okay, Romans 10, 9. Uh, who had that one? Clay, you got that one. All right, I need Mark 1 5. That's a short, easy one. Uh, Kenny, you can handle that. Um, <laughs> sorry, I could resist. Whatever. All right, 
And then uh, at the end, we're all going to go to Acts 16. Okay? Acts 16. Now, let me set this up. Okay? Uh, what we're going to look at is response. Okay? Here are four examples of the Bible calling for response or witnessing someone who is responding properly to the gospel. You follow me? Okay? So, in the case of Jesus, Mark 1.15, he's saying this is how you are to respond. Okay? Uh, in <coughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 37, Peter's going to tell us, here's how to respond. Okay? And a couple, of, and at least one of the others, uh, it's how the person is responding properly to the gospel. Okay? So let's pay attention to the biblical examples of response. Who's got that Acts chapter 2 one? And when they heard the no. Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry, dude. let me set this up. This is Peter's, this is the first Christian sermon ever preached. If you can look at it this way. Uh, uh, Jesus told them, stay in Jerusalem, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they're praying and seeking the Lord. Jesus has already gone back. Holy Spirit shows up. They're all running around speaking in tongues. They don't even know that they're speaking in tongues, but people from all over the world are there for Pentecost, and they're hearing the gospel being preached in their own languages. So it's that, you know, the yeah. So all of that's going on. People have come in and said, you're drunk. And Peter, Peter says, you guys are crazy. They're not drunk. Let me tell you what's happened. Now, what Peter does is he preaches a very um, <coughs> offensive gospel message. He's not nice. He doesn't pull out any punches. He says, you killed the Messiah. But that wasn't thwarting God's plan. It was God's plan. He's your only hope for salvation. So he has preached that message. Okay? First Christian message of come to Christ. First time the gospel has been preached in the New Testament area. Sorry, Darren, now read that. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brother, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so some people, obviously, we know from the story, reject. Okay? Some people's hearts are hardened. Some are softened. For the ones that were softened, what did they do? What was the next step for them? They turned to Peter and said, what do we do? What shall we do? I want in. What's our next? Okay, I, I'm there. What do we do? What's Peter's response? He tells them to respond how? Yeah. Repent. And what? Don't forget that's important. Now, is Peter putting baptism as a part of their salvation? No, but the baptism was part of that public profession that I've now put my faith and my trust in Christ. It's still to exact all the stuff you already know. It's that outward, you know, symbol of what's happened on the inside. But and he this is important. He, did, he didn't say you had to become a theologian. No, all he's right now. Repent. Right, repent, son. You're come, repent right now. Okay, then I'm going to take you down. You make your public profession of faith. We're going to baptize you. We're going to save you. But your repentance did. Because some people, I think, think they have to know a lot more. Yes. These guys didn't. And they'll think. It's the first they ever heard of. It's the first they heard of. I didn't know. Really? It was, okay. I'm there. Right? Somehow God grants them faith and however that works. And they're ready to respond. The proper response for them was repent. And put your faith in Christ and do that publicly in, through, through baptism. Right? Okay. All right. So, uh, what's the next one? Romans 10, 9. Just 9 or 9 and 10? 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with your heart a man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting for salvation. Now, Joe and I talked about this verse at length this afternoon. It's so, I know when I was first came to Christ, I really liked this verse and the part in it that says, because I was still trying to get my theology straightened out, I like the part where it says, with my mouth I'm supposed to confess, right? And because, you know why? Because it made, there was something for me to do, right? But then, when you begin to recognize that Romans is sort of, sort of kind of Paul's systematic theology written out, you begin to read it, you recognize a couple of things. First of all, when Paul lays this out, when he says you've got to believe, what does believe equal? Faith. You, you could write in your margin in your Bible, belief equals faith. When he says that you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
You can't believe without faith. That This is the faith element. Remember, the same guy that wrote Ephesians is writing this. Right? The same guy that wrote Ephesians, and what we just read a few minutes ago about how we come to God, is writing this. That's the exact same thing. All right? And he says, when we confess with our mouths, what's taking place there? That's confession in your Bible. You can write in the margin. Confession equals repentance. Yeah, that's right. You're, you're I had a guy. Out. I had a guy in jail this weekend, and we were talking about that Isaiah passage and how he was tripped up because Isaiah didn't repent. I said, No, but Isaiah confessed. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips. That is repentance. We want so badly to have little boxes over here we can check off. You know. But true faith and repentance supersedes boxes. Because yeah. the way that, it, that Tom Clay's put it this way, the, the way that the divine transaction takes place in Sonny might be a little bit different than the way that it took place in you. You might have said something, he might not have said anything, but the bottom line is, it happened. Belief, faith, repentance, it all somehow happened in there. This is the biblical godly response to that, Carl. Uh, no, thanks. I think we take this, we make this verse easy. Yes. And, well, mm -hmm. little Johnny, he confessed and said it was a long time ago. Bless God, I'm safe. And to confess with your, your mouth in Rome <laughs> meant a lot more to confess with your mouth in the tropics. It sure does. Because, so. I mean, let me get the people around you. Nero had a time with Christians. All right. Uh, we still have another Mark 1 15. Who had that one? Thank you. That's right. 115 or 15? 1 15. Thank you. I said 15. Sorry. Mark 1 5. And all the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay, it was 115. I'm sorry. 115. I told you guys it's been a long day, right? I, I, okay, right. I'm saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in God. Who said that? It's red in your Bible, right? If you got one of the red letter editions, that's the red. Okay. All right. So, y'all laughing at me? Sorry. Okay. It's red. It's red. Right? If you got a red, I don't have a red letter edition, so I don't But if it's a red letter edition, bottom line is this Jesus, Jesus is speaking about how to get saved. And the two words that he uses are repent and believe. Repent and believe. Okay. Um, all right, we'll look at one more. That should be enough because when it's read, you kind of stop there, right? All right, Acts, everybody go to Acts 16. Everybody whose phone hasn't died. <coughs> Acts 16, verse 25. Really cool story. This is the Philippian jailer. Remember that dude? Acts 16, verse 25. <coughs> <laughs> We're going to read all the way through 34. I'm going to get, who wants, someone will read that for me. <laughs> so, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everybody's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer had been roused out of sleep, and he had seen the prison doors open... He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do not, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for the lights, and they rushed in and trembled with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas, and after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Look what happens next. Keep going from verse 32. <coughs> and they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in the house. In other words, he, he, the jailer gets his whole household together, brings them out, says, okay, Paul, preach the gospel to us. You, realize, you, you ever notice that? I don't know why. I've never noticed that, but I was studying that passage today. I never really noticed that. Yeah, I know the whole Philippian jailer and his whole family are saved, but I didn't realize there was this part where he kind of gave the Philippian jailer a taste the jailer is, is, hey, by the way, this is not just for use for your household. He runs inside, gets them all up. He's got to get them up out of bed. And he brings them out and says, all right, everybody's listening. Paul's preaching. All right, keep going, buddy. 
And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, and he and his whole household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. So what did the Philippian jailer do? It's right there at the end, verse 34. It's not as explicit here as it is in other places, right? But the end of it says he was rejoicing because he believed. believed. He believed. Okay. He's got to be rejoicing because now his whole family also apparently has believed. This is that very night Paul baptized him, or somebody did, right? Now, what does he go on to do? Right? Um, look at verse 33. What does he do for Paul and Silas? Now, who locked Paul up? Who locked him up? I mean, the actual, not who commanded him to be locked up, but who did the locking? Now, I don't know about you guys, but you guys know the customs here. You've heard this preach before, right? The reason why this jailer is about to kill himself is because if, as a jailer, a prisoner gets free, you have to take the punishment that the prisoner was supposed to have. That was the custom in those days, right? So, earthquake happens. Man, there's no grace at all in this law. He's coming out. The prison doors are open, and he assumes they're all gone, and he's going to fall on his sword because he doesn't want to become a lamp. What was it? Street, street lamp. lamp, right. Okay? Because that's what could happen. Right? So, he's going to die in what was considered an honorable manner. He's going to take his own life. Paul Howler said, we're all still here. Always wondered what the world was going on. Not with Paul and Silas. I know what's going on then, but with all the other prisoners. Yeah. Now, but that's the story for another day, I guess. That's a question for Adam. Yeah, I got a feeling those dudes are there. <laughs> they were all singing. Yeah, okay. So, hey, when, go ahead. I, I, I really think it's important, <coughs> too, that we see this pattern, and it's, I don't think it's nitpicking to say the believing comes before the repentance. Yeah. I think the heart thing has to happen first because repentance means nothing. If they don't believe the gospel, if they don't if they don't buy into that they're a sinner and Jesus is the the you know the, the price is going to pay the price for their sins. If they don't buy that, the repentance from that point means nothing. Absolutely. So I mean I, I, I it's it's not Nick Pittman, but it kinda is. Mm -hmm. Something has to happen in here. Yes. Before and look, and this, and this is illustrated with this jailer because okay, this jailer's life's on the line. He's not letting his twelve year old lock them up. He locked them up, okay? He had to have stood over them, and he's the one that locks the shackles around their wrists, locks <coughs> the shackles around their ankles. Whatever wounds that they had from what had happened earlier in the day when they got arrested, because they'd been beaten and thrown rocks at, all this kind of stuff, right? He knew what had happened to them, right? Now, after he gets saved, what's the first thing he does? Washes their stripes. He washes their wounds. Yeah. He didn't oh, care before. He didn't care a thing about what was happening, right? right? What does that demonstrate that's taking place inside this dude? Right? He has believed, he has come to faith in Christ, and now everything is different. Because he was dead, and now he is, God has risen him up. Right? And so we see in the actions of the... Now we know at the end, I mean, the Bible of Paul is very you know, explicit in saying that the dude is rejoicing in his believing. Okay? But his action, you didn't need that. Because his actions are showing you that that's exactly what's taking place. A change has happened. And it's evident in the man's actions. How many times do you think he ever set his family in front of a prisoner and said, listen? <laughs> right? So we see the actions of repentance. We see the actions of belief. We see the results of a change. Right? So, the things that become extremely apparent in response, in the biblical responses that we see, either those that are called for or those that are demonstrated to us in Scripture, always kind of, sort of, have this formula, and I hate saying it, though, because it's not really a formula of repentance or belief. Right? We're saved by faith. And this has implications in the way that we should present the gospel. It has implications in the way that we should call for a response to the gospel. Simple, isn't it? The gospel is so simple, and yet it's so messy, all at the same time, all at the same time.
the, the, the person who has un, no understanding whatsoever of the gospel, has no theological background, can be saved, and somebody with a PhD in the Bible can be saved in the same way. So simple, yet so messy <coughs> at times. We need to be very biblical in our language, okay? We say, in order to be saved, you have to do this, right? Someone says, well, I want to be saved, so I, how do I respond to them? When, you know, that was the day when those two little girls come up to us at the end of the well, it was Sunday afternoon and said, you know, we're ready, we want to be saved. Okay, what must we do to be saved? I want to say to them, and rightly I need to say to them, in order to be saved, you need to do this, right? Okay, now, here's the deal. When we say you need to do this, we need to be extreme. I mean, we almost need to be scared over what we say next. Because there is no this that I can do to be saved. You realize that? There's no this out there. If there's a this, it's a work. And it's not grace, and it's not faith. Does that make sense? It's I mean, this is part of that stuff. That's really, so any this after that is really dangerous. And yet we still have to say this, right? And we, we got to do that. So here's my conviction. <laughs> you make that sense. <laughs> you know, you do that, right? So I'll say this. <laughs> what we say next. <laughs> better be, we gotta, what we say next. <laughs> better be real biblical. <laughs> it's got to be biblical. Let's use biblical language now. But I think right. a good way to check them is to have them tell you what they believe. Because yes. that's how we deal with children when no. you know when children yes. want to be saved. The first thing I want to do, I want to hear what you believe you're, you know, well, what do you believe? A lot of times we ask them, have you asked Jesus to come into your heart? Yes. <coughs> that, that doesn't that's, carry much water. No, it doesn't. Yeah. But, you know, you know well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to invoke some little sense in what your child going to say. Yes, I have. Of course. Let me make one comment on just. One thing I do when they come, kids come to my office to talk to me, I do two things. I always ask the kid, "What do you believe? Tell me, tell me what you believe, you know, about Jesus." And, and I want to listen very carefully. Do they have, you know, the, the understanding of the problem? And explain to the kids. Right? And then I ask them. I will ask the child this, but I ask the parent this. I'll ask them. Let me ask you something. What change have you seen come in your life? What, what you know? Because I usually talk to them after they have come to Christ, and and they're talking to me about baptism, and I'm trying to find out do I really have a reason. Merit to believe that kids can't say to, to baptize them. And, you know, what I'm looking for there then is that evidence of repentance. And the child language, that might be very, very simple language. I, you know, I, I stopped doing this or stopped doing it. It might be some kind of small little sins compared to what some adults. I don't want to hear that. Now ask the parent, what changes have you seen in the child? Have you seen evidence of the God? And because really that's the evidence then that's been true repentance is, is the change. And uh, not, and I never asked to, to, to digest Jesus in your heart. Because that's confusing language. It's not just the language necessarily. So, I'm not saying that someone can't get saved by asking Jesus to come into their heart. But what I am saying is this I think we need to be very careful and very wary simply because it's not biblical language. Even the biblical language struggles a little with this. Okay? Because there's no this. Because we are saved by grace through faith. It is a free gift of God. Even that comes from God, Paul says. So if, if we're saved by doing anything, if, if, if we're saved by any merit of our own, then we're not saved. You know, I'm going to invoke some of you guys who were here, and you remember when Willis Henson, when I first got here, was our interim pastor. And he was getting at this. He said this a, a couple of different times. I heard him talking about this. He says, you know, he says, I've preached a great sermon on the gospel. I've invited people to come forward. Some guys come up to the pew, right? And suddenly he realizes I'm lost and I need Jesus. He lets go. He steps out of that aisle. He comes walking down that aisle as fast as he can. He gets down to me, the preacher, right? And he grabs me by the hand and says, I need to be saved, right? And Willis used to put it this way. And he's getting at this same thing. He says, he says I believe in my heart that the guy was saved long before he got to me. He was saved long before he got to me, right? And everything that happens after that is more for him and for his assurance than it is for his salvation. Because he's already moved. Okay, let me back. All right. So Willis was making this description this way. You may have to ask him to clarify exactly how he said it, or we can go back and find those DVDs. But he said, you know, guys hanging on to his pew at the end of the sermon, 
preachers preached on the gospel or whatever. Maybe preached on a shoelace. God can still save somebody, right? And, and the invitation's going on. He finally lets go of that pew in front of him. You know, my old preacher used to go white knuckling because you're squeezing that pew so hard because you don't want to, okay, that's it, I'm getting out. Step out in the aisle. He walks all the way down to the preacher, grabs the preacher by the hand and says, I want to be saved. You know, Willis said it this way. I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt he was saved long before he got to me. <coughs> Everything that happens after that is the formalities of, of, of putting the roots of assurance in a man's heart. Because as a preacher, I'm going to say to him, well, then repent and believe. Right? And he's going to do that. And, and, and we're going to rejoice in his salvation. Right? So let's be biblical in what we say in those moments. Let's be careful to use the same language the Bible uses. The Bible talks about belief. It talks about faith. Talks about repentance. Well, let's use those three words. As we talk to people in those moments of saying to them, okay, it's time for you to take that step of faith. Okay, um, probably a whole lot can be said here. I'm going to move forward. You want to say something else? Go ahead. Well, no, I, was, I thought you were keeping very close. I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting ready to. I'm going to have a couple things housekeeping. Well, no, I, let me, okay, then if you're going to do housekeeping, let me finish. Back, back, to, back to Isaiah. You don't necessarily have to turn there. I'm going back to where we started, Isaiah chapter 6. He's standing there in that temple, right? Old picture of the gospel right here in this one passage. The foundations are shaken and all that sort of stuff, right? He says, woe unto me, he's recognized his sin, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king. Or, he's confessed his sin. Right? He's believing. <laughs> he's seeing he's believing. Then one of the seraphim flew over to me picture of Jesus having the burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar the altar in the temple that's pretty cool and he touches my mouth and said behold this has touched your lips your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for Isaiah stands before God and he is clean <coughs> not because of anything he's done because this picture of Jesus in the form of this seraphim flying over, taking the, the coal from the very altar. Man, talk about pictures that Isaiah would get. He would understand that. He's using the Jewish pictures of atonement. And, and he flies over and he touches his knees. Right? And his sins are atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? What is Isaiah's response? Repentance, belief. He's following Jesus. Right? Jesus says, repent, follow me. Believe, follow me. And there it is. All of it, right there. In one picture. Before Jesus has even come in the form of a human being, the whole gospel. Isaiah chapter 6. And right now, the last little box that you have there on our chart, Isaiah stands at the feet of Jesus still, worshiping him in his glorified state. And that's what we have to look forward to. It's pretty cool stuff. It's called the gospel. It's powerful. It's powerful. What did Peter preach to those people that day when 3,000 are added to the church? He preached the gospel. Just the gospel. You know? It was an offense to some. It was the power of God to salvation for others. Never forget my old college buddy, Abi, lived in the room across the room from a Calcutta, India. Uh, came from a Hinduistic background. Spent a whole year sharing the gospel with him, myself and some of my other Christian friends, when I was a junior in college. You know, fairly new to the faith myself. We did the best we could with what we knew at the time. Share the gospel with him. Towards the end of the year, he finally said to us, "Nope, I don't. Uh, why not? It's offensive. So this whole idea that a person can be a sinner their whole life and then suddenly be forgiven of God and be okay in the next life." Remember, he comes from Hinduism. I gotta live good enough to not be a cockroach in the next life, because I'm one now. Then maybe I got to be a bird. Now I'll live good enough, maybe I get to go be a horse. And then after that, maybe I get to be a person. You know, you gotta earn your way all the way through it. And the gospel was an offense to the man. And he says, I want no part of it. 
I never saw him again. Now I hope seeds were planted and he eventually came to Christ. I don't know. I totally lost touch with him. I have no way to get in touch with him ever again. But for some, the gospel is an offense. We can't do anything to take that offense away. Or we've changed the gospel. We don't have the gospel at all. <coughs> Peter's message was, you all ben. crucified him. That's what he told him. You crucified him. And I'm sure that didn't say good to their pride. It did not. Many were offended. Many were offended. But the bottom line is, guys, all we have is the gospel. We cannot add anything to it to make it seem like it's cool in a society where we want to see Christianity be cool. We can't take anything away from it to let it be less offensive to somebody else. It stops being the gospel. It stops being powerful. All we have to do is share the gospel and let God do the rest. This is all we got. Let me pray for us as we close this part of it, and then Joe's got a bunch of housekeeping. I just need to move a couple of so we'll take Let me uh, let me pray for us. God.